Hi. In the dim past, I ran a value technology fund where we often found a tech stocks with lots of value, but unfortunately unmeshed in a lawsuit. Say the company sued another company who, so it claimed, stole its patents. How to value whether the appellant, the plaintiff, claim was realistic? Or what were its chances of winning? And just how big a win? Because often a win in a lawsuit could make the stock go up a lot, as much as four or five times, often overnight, whereas the loss would halve it. How to go about it? I already explained once before how to estimate the value of IP, intellectual property, in tech companies as the sum of the last few years of research and development, depending on technology and whether it was mostly research or development. The latter is more worthwhile. Then there's the market value of what the company sold before, before someone stole its patent. It can be a, a benchmark. And there are other ways to measure the value of the intellectual theft. If the upside seemed high enough, we often went deep in to estimate the chance for a big win. Since I'm not a lawyer, just a rocket scientist with two other size degrees, nor were my analyst lawyers, we often paid good money to top patent lawyers to advise us on this. But no matter how good the lawyers were, at the end of the day, a lawsuit meant rolling the dice, because who knows how the judge or a jury would decide. Well, in the case of a jury, one never knows especially in the case of tech disputes. So if you saw, if we saw a jury case, we kept away. No one can sleuth 12 people whose IDs are secret and should be. But in the case of lawsuits involving a judge, we often waited right in, and a few times we did well. How? By knowing a few simple principles about motivations and MOs, that's modus operandi of judges and lawyers, and how the legal combat and the law courts really work. So here, without prejudice, are three such principles as told to me by others. In case you ever want to sleuth a cheap stock where the value may surface depending on the judge decision or a settlement in which the two sides agree to a compromise. First principle, you have to understand that the judge doesn't want the lawsuit in his or her courtroom. Why not? For two reasons. First reason, if he decides he can be wrong and then be overturned on appeal. Judges hate that. If a judge has too many of his decisions overturned, he loses face among his peers. Also, if his judgment is appealed, the judge also loses face in the eyes of the law administrator, the minister of justice, who would have to pay for the extra trial, and the room, and the rent, and the clerks, so the judge may not be so fast promoted. Therefore, the unwritten rule for judges is lean hard on both sides and push them to get the stinky mess of a lawsuit out of your courtroom. Force them to settle. You may, be, you may be surprised to learn that in some U.S. states, it is even written into official guidelines for judges, although in vaguely, vague legalese. The other reason is that it is far easier to squeeze both sides to settle than to find the real merits of the case, which, in the case of patents, is usually very complicated. In fact, like a portfolio manager, the judge doesn't want to pick stocks. He doesn't want to pick size. It's too risky. So he becomes an indexer. He walks right down the middle to keep his job. After all, a judge is not a risk-taking entrepreneur, just a civil servant with a good pension. Which leads us to the second principle. How do judges squeeze both sides, both defendant and plaintiff? One way is to scowl inside A and rule favorably in side B behavior in some small matters, so that side A get the message and start reducing his claim, moving closer to settlement. Then, if side A that the judge has smiled upon becomes obstinate because he's winning, the judge then shoots him or her a sub-ruling in its direction to get him moving too. How to know when all this happens and where's the likely compromise point? You can follow the trials in and out by reading the PACER pages, PACER, P-A-C-E-R. PACER is a service that in the U.S. lets you track the trial app happenings in detail. It'll cost you, but then sleuthing is not supposed to be cost-free. Nothing is. But since so few investors bother to do it, these costs can, be, can pay you back manifold from the pocket of the, of the lazy bones. If you follow a trial this way, very often you can see the two sides moving towards settlement inch by inch by inch, little by little, and this is a big open sequence. Once two sides settle, 
it is very hard for any of them to appeal because they have to sign in blood, so to speak, and notarize that they knew what they were signing. Very difficult to go and appeal that. Now, the third principle. In many cases, the lawyer has less interest in getting his client's maximum gain than in not peeving the judge, that is, forcing the client to settle. After all, the lawyer already got most of his or her fee, and the client is very close to the price he had in mind. Now comes the time, the time to help the judge rather than the client. This, at least, is what I am told by others, without prejudice. And this is why, in many cases, so I'm told, when the two sides are very close to settlement and can't go the final inch, the judge gets the two opposing lawyers into his or her chambers, looks them in the eye, and says, tell me honestly, how can you push your client to make them settle? It is at this point when the client better understand the game, because the client can throw a monkey wrench into the machinery and tell the lawyer, tell the judge, I ain't settling. I am asking for the full amount. And what's more, I'm raising the bar. I'm going to prove the other side is a criminal and should go to jail. I have copies of his email in which he said nasty, illegal things. And I have testimonies of witnesses too. In other words, I want him jail and I'm going to go to criminal court. At which point the judge sees black because he can just see the case exploding into one big black mess, which will get him, the judge, into very bad order with the administrator and with his or her colleagues. So here the judge, I am told, looks the lawyer in the eye and says, you're kidding me, right? You mean you can't deliver your client? You didn't tell him to strategically rebel against you, right? Just to get the last 20% more in damages. Here the lawyer has to look the judge in the eye and say, your honor, hand on my heart, I'm telling you, I cannot control my client. And that's the moment of the final truth. Because if the judge ever discovers the lawyer lied to him and preferred the client top interest to his, then this lawyer will never win another lawsuit in the court again. So I'm told. The lawyer, of course, can also say, Your Honor, I'm sorry, but my client seems to be getting some side advice from a fund, a fund manager who owns 10% of his stock. And if this proves true, the judge then throws up his hand in the air and says, Give the fiddling clients 10% more and get him out of here and let me never see him again. What else should you know about sleuthing trials? Two more things. One has to do with physical investigations, the other with reading political situation involving litigation. First is to always visit the courtroom, see where it is taking place, befriend the local clerks who assign room and get people calendar. Calendar means getting a date for trial. The clerk often knows the judges backwards and the prosecutors, and is often bored and will tell you stuff if you're only nice to him or her, bring them coffee and listen. You do this in order to study the judges and prosecutors thoroughly, both as a human beings and as professionals. They all have their quirks and biases, expertise, and weak spots. It may even pay you to hire a local lawyer for an hour or two, and over lunch, class martinis, ask them to tell you the gossip about the judges and the prosecutors. Who owes which favors? Who is a Democrat? Who is a Republican? Who employs whose son or daughter? Who is sleeping with whom? After the third martini, you'll be surprised how much comes out, and so on. Of course, in these days of corona, such physical investigations are practically impossible temporarily because most trials have been either postponed or gone on Zoom. There's only so much in human information you can get from a screen, not face to face. But one of these days, Corona will be over, personal contacts will come again, and then you can start sleuthing again, and then the above rules may come in handy in case you want to sleuth a trial. The second benefit, these principles can come in handy in analyzing the current political situation in the US now about to end before the U.S. Supreme Court, after having been kicked out of all lower courts that just don't want to have anything to do with it. There, the above three rules can give you an extra insight and help you make some very specific forecasts. For example, how can a daring litigant force the Supreme Court to decide by arranging for a worse outcome if the court doesn't want to do its job? But let's stop right here. Remember, this is a channel for budding sleuth investors, not for politicians. So we'll leave politics to politicians and end it right here. That's all for today. Let me know in the comment below what you think of the above. Subscribe to the channel. Email this video to your friends so they're subscribed to. I'll see you next time. In the meantime, thank you very much for watching.